Um, the, the next panel uh, is entitled, Who is Constitution? The, the People, Political Movements, and the Courts, and will address uh, the relationship between social movements and the courts in interpreting the, Consti uh, the Constitution. And in this broad uh, topic that we've been looking at today on popular constitutionalism, we have uh, uh, three panelists uh, today. Uh, Professor Elizabeth Price Foley from Florida International University, Mark Tushnet from Harvard, and myself. Um, Professor Foley is going to speak first, and she will be talking about the Tea Party's constitutional vision. Um, she is the uh, Institute for Justice Chair in Constitutional Litigation and a professor of law at Florida International University School of Law. She serves on the editorial board of the Cato Supreme Court Review, an annual publication of the Cato Institute, in which leading legal scholars analyze the most important cases of the Supreme Court's most recent term. She's the author of numerous scholarly articles, as well as three books, Liberty for All, Reclaiming Individual Privacy in a New Era of Public Morality, and The Law, and Life, the Law of Life and Death. Her third book, uh, The Tea Party, Three Principles, was, is it, is it out yet? Brandon. It's just been published uh, by uh, Cambridge University Press. So, uh, Professor Paul. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I, when talking to, uh, with Jared uh, about the panel today, uh, uh, we, we decided that the, the basic topic would be whose constitution? Uh, so that's what I'm going to explore with you uh, over the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief because, you know, these things are much more fun uh, when we're engaging with each other, either as panelists or uh, uh, between the panelists and the, uh, and the audience. So I will try to be brief. But the, again, the topic is whose constitution, and then sort of the sub-question is, is who gets to decide what the constitution means? And let me give you my brief answers, and then I'll, uh, I'll elaborate a little bit. Okay, first question, whose constitution is it? Uh, I don't think there's any real debate about this, frankly. I think the, the constitution is ours. It belongs to we the people. Uh, it is a manifestation of the will of the people in the uh, highest legal sense. In fact, uh, a written constitution, which we have, is designed to be an anti-evolutionary device. It's supposed to place our structure of government beyond the reach of transient majorities. So a written constitution truly is designed to entrench we the people's vision of the proper scope of government power and hence the other side of the coin, uh, the scope of individual rights. Second question, who gets to decide the meaning of the constitution? That's easy too, in my opinion, we all do. I don't really see this as a courts versus the people battle per se. I think the judiciary has a proper role and I have my opinions on what the scope of that proper role is, which I'll share with you. And then I think of course we the people uh, as individuals as well as through our uh, politically elected representatives have a very important role as well. So no one group here dominates, uh, and the question is, are we uh, acting properly when we do what we do? Okay, so let's, let's focus on our judiciary for a minute, as well as our politically elected representatives, the political branches. Once our constitutional text gets ratified, the role of the judges and our politically elected representatives is to quote unquote, support this constitution. That's the specific language of the oath that they take under Article 6 of our constitution. And then you look further at some things that were said to the American people at the time the constitution was ratified. And I'm specifically gonna focus for a second on Federalist 78, which was uh, penned by Alexander Hamilton. In Federalist 78, uh, Hamilton assured the American people that they had nothing to fear from a judiciary that had the power of judicial review. He told the American people that the power of the judiciary was limited to enforcing the text of the Constitution, and in particular, enforcing the limits on government power that were spelled out in the text. 
So in Hamilton's view, this didn't mean that the judiciary was superior to the people, quite the contrary. In fact, here's what Hamilton told us. He said, the power of the people is superior to both, and by both he meant the judiciary and the legislature. And where the will, will of the legislature declared in its statute stands in opposition to that of the people declared in the Constitution, the judges ought to be governed by the latter, the Constitution, rather than the former. They ought to regulate their decisions by the fundamental laws, again the Constitution, rather than, those by, than by those which are not fundamental, i.e. ordinary statutes. Of course, the problem is that the judiciary has over time, uh, and I think particularly since the New Deal, been sort of remarkably, breathtakingly deferential to the legislatures. Its reflexive use of a modern rational basis review is essentially just a rubber stamp, and it's allowed government power, especially federal power, to grow exponentially. So in my view, the judiciary is simply not doing its job, certainly not the job that was envisioned in Federalist 78. It is not a vigorous enforcer of the basic architecture of our Constitution. Our judiciary needs to be more engaged, not less. So the Tea Party movement, about which I've just written my book, I think is a backlash to a large extent to this phenomenon. The Tea Party movement, despite the mainstream media's characterization to the contrary and its basic caricature of the uh, Tea Partiers, is defined by certain very well-defined and very old and important constitutional principles. And these principles have their roots in the political philosophy of the founding generation. And one of those principles, again, that I highlight in my book is originalism. And of course, I'm glad that Larry went before me because he's actually laid the groundwork as to what originalism means and what it doesn't mean, at least in an academic sense. And I certainly agree with the, the definition that he proffered. The idea that we have a written text and that that text has fixed, stable meaning and it should be interpreted according to the meaning ascribed to those words by those who wrote the words and ratified the words. Frankly, I think that's a principle that most Americans innately embrace. It's, it's what makes a written constitution a written constitution. So, for example, let's take the power to regulate commerce among the several states, right? The Commerce Clause, Article I, Section 8. It had a meaning to the founding generation that ratified it. It did not include the power to regulate purely intrastate activities with a substantial effect on interstate commerce. It's not a power to regulate things with a substantial effect on interstate commerce. It's a power to regulate commerce amongst the several states. So cases like Wickard v. Filburn, which you probably remember from law school, at least if you went to law school after 1942, uh, and uh, Gonzalez v. Reich, which you may not have because that was, what, 2005, I think, um, are, are just a little far afield from an originalist perspective. And I think uh, Justice Thomas has been the sort of most clear and ardent uh, supporter of this original vision of what it means to regulate commerce. But more importantly for today's purposes, I think, and for modern issues, the power to regulate commerce among the several states, certainly to the founders, did not include the power to compel commercial transactions upon the unwilling by forcing them into lifelong contracts that lack basic voluntary mutual assent of the parties. This was a basic presupposition about what made a contract legally binding. It existed at the time the, the Commerce Clause was ratified and frankly it continues to today, state police power exercises notwithstanding. I'll be happy to entertain that if you'd like to during question and answer. But so you can see what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the individual mandate of health care reform, and I'm trying to talk to you about why the Tea Party opposes that individual mandate. 
It's not because they don't think health insurance should be widely available. It's not because uh, they, they don't have any empathy for people without health care insurance. And it certainly isn't because they, they don't like it because the president is black. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with their belief and embrace of this principle of constitutional originalism. So from a Tea Partier's perspective, the court's latitude of interpretation, which is the way Madison put it back in the day, of the Commerce Clause, it just doesn't pass a basic laugh test, right, uh, from an originalist perspective. All right, so that's just one example. And, and the Tea Party is advocating for all of its principles in a very logical way. The, the same basic way that all American political movements advocate for their position and, and the changes they want to see happen. You know, all American political movements have started out basically as sort of mobs, right? And I don't mean that pejoratively, right? I mean, that's actually sort of a compliment. What I mean by that is large gatherings of people who are bound by common beliefs. And then once they sort of vent their anger in this sort of mob way, they very quickly mature, or at least most of them do, into sort of more strategic and pragmatic movements. And in the United States, this usually involves what I call a sort of a two-track strategy. The first track is where you try to effectuate your change by appealing to the courts, right? Where you actually start litigating things and asking the court to be engaged and to uh, undertake judicial review. And then the other track is that they try to appeal to uh, politics. They try to appeal to our uh, politically elected representatives, the president, uh, their local representatives, their senators. And they also try to get their fellow citizens involved. And this manifests itself, for example, in uh, sometimes in explicit constitutional amendments that are sought. The Tea Party has been pretty active in this regard. They've sought uh, many types of explicit constitutional amendments. I'll just mention a few. One's called the Repeal Amendment. Uh, which basically gives the state sort of an, a, a, an opportunity to express their displeasure in a, actually a non-binding way uh, of, of federal laws that the states view as being uh, too aggressive or as entrenching upon uh, the residual state powers under the 10th Amendment. Um, and then Professor Randy Barnett has a thing he calls the Federalism Amendment, which, again, it has the sort of same thrust. It's trying to restore the vertical balance of powers between the feds and the states in a way that is more consonant with the original vision. There are uh, proposals to amend the 16th Amendment, which give, gave the federal government the power to impose direct income taxes. There have been proposals from Tea Partiers to, in fact, repeal the 17th Amendment, which allows us to directly elect our senators rather than picking them via our state legislatures. And of course, the ubiquitous favorite of many political movements, particularly right of center movements, is the balanced budget amendment. Okay, so, so the point of the debate really isn't about whether uh, both of these tracks, these strategies, the the legal strategy and the political strategy are legitimate or good, because they're both legitimate and good. Instead, the debate, as it always seems to be in constitutional <coughs> law, is about achieving certain results. And specifically, it comes down to a debate, as it always does, between the living constitutionalist and the originalist, and which way is the best way to interpret the Constitution. Do you view the written constitution as an impediment to progress? Or do you think it's worth preserving? In fact, Larry Kramer's book, The People Themselves, that uh, started the whole, I think it started the whole popular constitutionalism movement, which itself is a movement, uh, was published in 2004. And if you go back to 2004 and think about what was happening at that time and why this caught on fire beginning in 2004, was that there was a growing perception by the political left that the judiciary was veering too far to the right, right? And so they thought the federal bench in particular was going to be too originalist for a while, and they needed to find another sort of way to achieve their desired progressive ends. Hence, popular constitutionalism. 
If the political left was confident, for example, that they could get enough living constitutionalists on the Supreme Court, just five of them, of course, is all it takes, and they might do that quite soon, then I suspect that the popular constitutionalism movement would quickly die down. I think the progressive uh, left is happy to let the, the court do their dirty work if they want to, just like, frankly, the right is. But let me say this. I do think that letting judges reinterpret or, as some have put it, implicitly amend amending the Constitution by invoking living constitutionalism is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, it undermines the respect for the rule of law. It's dangerous for the stability of our government, which is based on a text with fixed meaning. In fact, properly understood, living constitutionalism rests on a foundation of sand. It allows five of nine unelected Supreme Court justices with lifetime tenure to simply uh, mold, remold the Constitution in a way that fits their own subjective purposes. Now, this is a problem, right? Because living constitutionalism has a great rhetorical appeal, doesn't it? I mean, who wants a dead Constitution? I, I don't know about you. In fact, my, my, I had this conversation with my 11-year-old not too long ago. You probably shouldn't have this conversation with an 11-year-old. Uh, but she's a law professor's daughter, so that's just the way it goes. And I told her I was going to give a talk about living constitutionalism versus originalism. And she asked me what that mean, and I kind of gave her the definitions. And she said, well, Mommy, what's wrong with a living constitution? You don't want a dead one, do you? And I realized at that moment this is a problem for originalists. They have to somehow come up with a spin that counters uh, this very appealing label. But, but more substantively, think about what living constitutionalism does from the perspective of we the people. It allows these unelected judges to bypass our will, okay? Because the Constitution is the will of the people. This is what Alexander Hamilton assured us in Federalist 78. So if you're an originalist, you use originalism not to achieve specific desired results, but simply as a way to honor and enforce the text as it was meant by those who wrote it and ratified it. And that, of course, is the people. So in my view, judicial review has both legitimate and illegitimate uses depending on the mode of construction being employed. So if you appeal to the judiciary, if you use this track one strategy, sometimes that's a legitimate way to honor the people's will, and sometimes it's a way to bypass the people's will, in my view. Also, in my view, that second strategy, this political strategy, where you appeal to your politically elected representatives or you try to get an explicit constitutional amendment enacted uh, via Article 5, is always per se, an appropriate thing to do. Both the political left and the political right have done this uh, throughout time. They've tried to lobby their representatives and their fellow citizens to convince them that constitutional change is needed. So this track two strategy, this political strategy, is the kind of living constitutionalism, frankly, that the founders had in mind. If you go back, the most ardent living constitutionalist of his day was Thomas Jefferson, right? And if you read what Jefferson had to say, he said, hey, look, I think we the people ought to get together every 20 years or so and have a new constitutional convention. And if we, there's problems with the constitutional text, let's rewrite it. When we do that, when we get involved in that legitimate Article 5 way, we the people are taking ownership and control of our Constitution. We've done it 27 times in the past. We can do it again if we want to. And from my perspective, that's the kind of popular constitutionalism that I think we can all support. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Foley. Uh, we'll now hear from Professor Mark Tushnet, who is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Professor Tushnet served as a law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall and specializes in constitutional law and theory, including comparative constitutional law. His research includes studies examining, skeptically, the practice of judicial review in the United States and around the world. 
He also writes in the area of legal and particularly constitutional history with works on the development of civil rights law in the United States and currently is engaged in a long-term project on the history of the Supreme Court in the 1930s. He's the author of articles and books too numerous to mention, but including why the Constitution matters and taking the Constitution away from the courts. Professor Tushman. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here and, and uh, to be able to uh, talk and, and listen to this conversation about popular constitutionalism. Uh, what I'm going to do in uh, my remarks is offer some speculations on uh, the relationship between popular constitutionalism and political organization. Uh, as a preface, I do want to, uh, Thomas Jefferson has just been invoked, and I sort of want to say a couple of things. Uh, about Thomas Jefferson. One is I sort of feel like saying, you know, he said in his first inaugural, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans. Well, we're all originalists and we're all living constitutionalists too. Uh, in fact, when you, uh, there are public opinion surveys and it turns out that most people are both originalists and living constitutionalists. Uh, the, the question is asked, should, should the Constitution be interpreted in light of contemporary circumstances and so on? And people say, sure. And then you ask them, should, they, should the Constitution be interpreted in light of its original meaning or something like that? And they say, sure. Uh, <laughs> so it's not, um, which is sort of what I think, too. <laughs> uh, uh, um, okay, the, the other thing about Jefferson is, is, is uh, it's, I, I think it's in the same letter about the every 19 years, but I may be wrong about this. Uh, but he has this great phrase about uh, the original, essentially the original understanding. He says, look, I was there. I knew these people. They were very smart and very thoughtful. Uh, uh, but much like us today is what he says, much like, except without the experience that we've had over the past 25 years, uh, suggesting that, either, that the decisions they made should not this doesn't have clear institutional implications, but it shouldn't be taken uh, as sort of the handed down truth from, from Sinai. Uh, we can reconsider it because, you know, they're like us, or we're like them. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to, to, as I say, talk about uh, political organization. And uh, the thoughts are provoked by trying to figure out what the relationship is or how the Tea Party resembles and differs from historical examples uh, of popular constitutionalism. Uh, and I want to focus on how popular constitutionalism takes place in various organizational forms. Uh, uh, one thing that's perhaps misleading about the term popular constitutionalism uh, is that it might suggest, at least under modern circumstances, that what we want to do is sort of just, you know, take a, a survey about what the folks think uh, and what the folks think is what popular constitutionalism is. Um, uh, but that's not, at least as, as the term developed, uh, what people who originated the idea uh, meant by popular constitutionalism. Even uh, Larry Kramer, who's been mentioned, uh, 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 well, Larry Kramer incorporates the, the mobs, the people out of doors, as they were put more, put more formally in the uh, framing era, uh, street demonstrations and riots. <clears throat> these are important in, in Kramer's conceptualization, but these, the people out of doors was not an unorganized group. Uh, to get people out on the streets, you had to do something. Uh, you know, there was some organization that lay behind the Tea Party, the not real Tea Party, the one that happened up there in Boston. Uh, um, and and you know, the classic uh, book about mobs, in, in political mobs in, in Jacksonian era is called Gentlemen of Property and Standing. Those are the people who organized the mobs. So I want to talk about what organizational forms there might be for popular constitutionalism. And I'm going to identify a two-track strategy as well, but it's a different two-track strategy from the one Professor Foley uh, just identified. Uh, I, I want to say just a bit about the first of her two tracks. Um, it seems to me historically uh, the court-focused track is, has not been that important for uh, popular constitutionalist movements. It's not that it's absent. Uh, so uh, 
but so there's immediately after the 14th Amendment, uh, supporters of uh, women's suffrage brought a lawsuit uh, seeking, um, saying that they were now entitled to suffrage. Susan B. Anthony went to jail. Uh, and, and you know, there was litigation uh, associated with it. Uh, but this was, and I think many of the examples historically are uh, ones of sort of political theater. The real energy of the woman suffrage movement was not in pursuing the litigation. And, and energy is an important concept uh, behind at least my understanding of uh, political, uh, uh, popular constitutionalism. Okay, so now what are, the, if we put the courts aside, what are the two kinds of stra uh, tracks that uh, I would want to identify? Well, I would distinguish uh, f between extra party organization and organization within the political party system. So extra party organizations are what have come to be called now civil society groups. In US history, the, probably the prime example of extra party organization in support of popular constitutionalism uh, is the civil rights movement of the 1960s, although I'm sure Willie would say, well, the labor movement of the late 19th and up to the 1930s was also an example of a civil society organization in support of a popular constitutional vision. Um, and I just would note that in connection with labor, labor organization, um, there was a fair amount of concern about whether the labor movement should participate in politics, should affiliate with a, uh, with a political party. Um, another example might be the early stages of the modern gay rights movement. Now, what these things do, these civil society organizations, or what I want to call extra party organizations, is operate outside the framework of the party system. So again, to use an example from the civil rights, or two examples from the civil rights era, uh, when there was, when the uh, March on Washington occurred, where um, Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech, um, <coughs> <coughs> there was quite a substantial conflict within the organizing group over the relationship or over what should be said at the, at, at the march. And the conflict was between people associated with the sort of heart of the movement, uh, the SNCC people, Student Nonviolent Organizing uh, Coordinating Committee people, and people who had emerged from a, a longer tradition of civil rights organizations in the North, and the latter were concerned that the speeches might be too radical in a way that would disrupt the movement of civil rights legislation through Congress. So the SNCC people were the extra party people, the other participants were working within the party. Um, there's a Freedom Democratic Party uh, uh, movement uh, in which delegates were elected from uh, a, um, an extra party convention in uh, Mississippi and went to Atlantic City and, and sought recognition uh, uh, by, by the Democratic Convention and uh, it was denied. That was largely, I think, I, I'm pretty sure, it was a form of political theater rather than a, a, a I would call a genuine serious effort uh, to transform the Democratic Party from within. Okay, now of course these, these extra party organizations have effects on the political parties. Politicians observe the energy deployed in them and they try to figure out how to take some political advantage of it. Uh, but in doing so, uh, some of the elements of the vision of popular constitutionalism uh, held by the extra party movement are almost certain uh, to be altered. So again, within the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the vision the popular constitutional vision, constitutionalist vision was a form of outcome-based, what we would now call outcome-based or substantive equality. Um, I, I'd note there was some conflict within the movement uh, about the relation between that vision, which was essentially universally shared within the movement, and ideas about what we would now call affirmative action. I don't want to get into that here. Once the energy of the movement was absorbed within the Democratic Party, 
that vision of outcome-based equality uh, had to be accommodated to more traditional ideas of process-based or formal equality for a variety of perfectly good reasons from within the context of the Democratic Party coalition. Um, uh, adopting a full-fledged substantive or outcome-oriented uh, um, um, vision would have created uh, uh, very serious conflicts within the Democratic Party. Another more recent example uh, would be the transformation of, uh, in, in the healthcare context, of support for a, call it British or Canadian style, single payer system into the much more complex versions that were offered first by the Clinton administration and now in the Affordable Care Act. So, um, extra party organization of popular constitutionalism has been quite important in assisting the development of changes in what we might call professional constitutionalism. That's not a great phrase, but it's, I, I can't figure out, it's not, I don't want it to be associated with academic constitutionalism, it's sort of popular constitutionalism versus the constitutionalism associated with uh, the, the, the principal uh, political parties. A and, and it assists that development through its effects on the political parties, uh, but the transformation of the extra party vision is as important uh, as the influence. Uh, and here I want to stress finally one point, which is there's almost necessarily a pretty strong connection between the extra party version of popular constitutionalism organizational version of popular constitution. Connection between that and a fairly strong anti-establishment point of view. Uh, and in some ways, that's one of the main sources of the energy that goes into the uh, extra party organizational form. Now to the second track. The, the alternative to extra party organization is organization within the party system. Uh, but this too takes two forms. <laughs> First, organization as a third party uh, and organization as a, a faction within one of the major parties. Uh, now, third party or the third party uh, version um, can be anti-establishment as well in the way that I described the extra party version could be. It's probably not possible for popular constitutionalism organized as a faction within a political party to be anti-establishment because the political party is almost by definition already part of the establishment. Now, on the third party version, everybody knows that third parties don't succeed in winning many elections. They win some, but uh, they don't win many elections. As structurally, the reasons for that in the United States are well known single member plurality winner election processes like the ones we have in the US are quite unforgiving for third parties. Uh, but everybody also knows that some parties have succeeded quite substantially in altering the political agenda and, and obtaining um, public policies consistent with their popular constitutionalist views. The standard examples here are the populists in the late 19th century and the progressives in the early 20th century. They did organize as politic parties and political parties and they did sometimes win elections. Populist party in, in the Midwest and to some degree in the South, uh, progressives in the Midwest and the Mass, West, West, even an occasional socialist uh, could win. Uh, uh, Victor Berger and, and Vito Marcantonio, names that are lost to history, but they were socialist members of Congress um, under the Socialist Party ticket. Actually, Marcantonio, I think, was called the American Labor Party in New York, but it was a socialist. Uh, but again, electoral structures limit the direct successes of these third parties. They succeed on the policy constitutional level because of their influence on the major parties. And, and again, the structural logic is pretty clear. Politicians in closely divided jurisdictions uh, could see electoral advantages from adopting the programs urged by the third parties. When the third party supporters get discouraged because of their electoral failures, they become available to the major parties. Uh, and, and that's how the progressives worked. Uh, uh, and the populace. Uh, finally, there's the strategy of organizing as a faction within one of the major parties. Uh, and I think, although, well, I think this is the Tea Party strategy. Um, and I want to conclude with some speculations about why 
this particular strategy might be a bad one from their own point of view, although, of course, since I'm not a member of or sympathetic with uh, their views, that my analysis could be taken with a fair grain of salt, you know, you know don't throw me in the, bri in the briar patch. But I actually think this is right. Uh, um, so uh, the reason emerges from thinking about some current, reasonably current examples, labor unions in the Democratic Party, uh, African Americans in the contemporary Democratic Party, social conservatives in the Republican Party over the past few decades. What these, all these share is that the party with which they've affiliated or with which, it, it, within which they've become a faction have given them at most symbolic rewards without fully assimilating their constitutional visions. Uh, labor unions and card check in the most recent uh, example, for example. And I'm willing to defend the proposition that social conservatives and judicial appointments in recent Republican administrations are symbolic victories rather than substantive ones. I, you know, that might be controversial, but I think it's, it's right. Um, the structural reason that, that I think might be working is also pretty straightforward. It's the nowhere to go principle. Party leaders know that these factions have nowhere else to go. Uh, labor unions certainly aren't going to support Republicans, nor are social conservatives going to support the Democrats. So party leaders, again, the leaders of the party within which these entities are factions, uh, have to do just enough to give the factions enough to stay in the party. And given that the factions have nowhere else to go, just enough can be quite little. Uh, so if there were a real threat of a third party defection, then you might be able to extract more. If there were a Tea Party line on the ballot, uh, Republicans might well do more to keep people from voting for the Tea Party than they have to do to keep the Tea Partyers within the Republican Party now. Now, there's something of a, a structural point here as well. Organization as a third party isn't going to work electorally, uh, and the third party is eventually going to disappear. But for a while, the people who would have affiliated with the third party can have some significant successes because their votes are available to both parties. Eventually, uh, they become uh, a faction within one of the other major parties, uh, and then their influence uh, dissipates. But it seems to me uh, starting out as a faction is actually not a really good strategy for achieving substantial gains for the vision of popular constitutionalism associated with these, uh, call them dissenting or anti-establishment groups. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tushnet. Um, our last panelist is me. Um, uh, <laughs> professor Jared Goldstein is a professor of law at the Roger Williams <laughs> University School of Law, where he teaches constitutional <coughs> and environmental law. Professor Goldstein, thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Jared for inviting me and for organizing this conference, <laughs> and the dean for supporting it, and for all the other panelists. Who I, I really appreciate your uh, coming today. Um, I am going to use PowerPoint. Um, let's see here. There we go. Uh, I have slowly uh, adopted what I, I believe is a new pedagogical style that someday people will be writing articles on called uh, PowerPoint Socratic. And people will be talking about the, the adoption, adaption of uh, the Socratic method to PowerPoint for some time. Um, <laughs> my, my talk today is entitled Unpopular, Constitutional, Unco Unpopular Constitutionalism, Constitutional Nationalism and the American Liberty League. And what I want to talk about is about the fight between the American Liberty League and uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1936 election over the constitutionality of the New Deal as an example of popular constitutionalism and its possible relevance today. Um, but first, I, I should explain what got me interested in the subject. And 
I came at this subject because of my interest in the Tea Party movement. Uh, I was interested, and I am interested in the Tea Party movement as an example of popular constitutionalism, or that is, it's a popular constitutional movement because it is centrally focused on effectuating its constitutional vision through everyday politics. Um, that is, its uh, focus is uh, centrally on the Constitution as the vehicle for uh, effectuating its ideas. I, I, would, I think the Tea Party movement is best understood as a particular kind of popular constitutionalist movement, and one that I would call a, con a constitutional nationalism. Um, and by that I mean it's a nationalist movement because it seeks to establish uh, and maintain sovereignty uh, of, for a community defined as a nation. Um, and, the, uh, and the Tea Party movement uh, is focused on, especially focused on establishing and policing the national boundaries. That is, what it means to be American is a central focus of the movement. And you can see this in the uh, first uh, sentence of the first chapter of Professor Foley's book, in which he asks, what makes America, America? Um, and I don't mean to pick on Pro Professor Foley, because this is simply just typical of, of what you see in the, the Tea Party movement, this focus on defining what it means to be American. And they answer the question by saying, the Constitution. And so you can see this in any number of Tea Party writings. I pick out a couple here. Uh, the Tea Party Manifesto by Joseph Ferris says, fundamentally, the Tea Party movement is about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, Dick Armey and Matt Kibbe in their similar uh, Tea Party Manifesto, which is actually on a, they're in a different faction of the Tea Party movement, say the same thing. The Tea Party movement is concerned first and foremost with recovering constitutional principles in government. So it's a constitutional nationalism because it's a movement that sees in the Constitution the dividing line between what is truly American and what is not. Now, this form of nationalism, which I'm calling here constitutional nationalism, may be a sort of mild form of nationalism compared to ethno-nationalism or religious nationalism or race-based nationalism. That is, here the national community is defined by commitment to an ideology, and it's an ideology defined by the movement's understanding of the Constitution, including the ideas that Professor Foley explains in, in her book, um, limited government, uh, individual liberty, free markets, national sovereignty, and these are the ideas that they read into the Constitution and define as being the key traits of our national identity. Now, there's no inherent problem in the idea of constitutional nationalism. The problem from my point of view is that this narrow, when you combine uh, what I perceive to be a narrow understanding of the Constitution um, with defining national identity based on embrace of those uh, national values, it means that people who don't share those values, who disagree with what, they, uh, with what they read into the Constitution, are not just wrong, but they are un-American. They're not part of the national community. Um, you know, so that you see in the Tea Party movement, you know, expressly nationalist uh, ideas like, like this, or just a notion that people who disagree with their national vision aren't just wrong, they're un-American. Um, and again, from Dick, Dick Armey's book, he's, you know, he says, liberals are hostile to the universal values of the American people. That is, so there are certain ideas and policies that have to be extinguished because they're fundamentally un-American. That is, they, they've defined the national community by identif identification with the Constitution, and those who don't agree with their view of the Constitution are not just wrong, but un-American, foreign, alien, and have to be defeated to take back the country. So I, I, this is what interests me about the, the Tea Party movement as an example of this particular flavor of uh, popular constitutionalism, what I would call a, a constitutional nationalism. Now, the Tea Party movement is just the latest in a series of constitutional nationalist movements. And so my interest in the subject got me interested in looking at earlier examples of uh, constitutional nationalism. Nationalism, And so the subject of this talk is about one of them, the American Liberty League, which was created in 1934 to fight the New Deal as unconstitutional and an un-American aberration. Now, this area in which I'm talking about is familiar ground, though, for a lot of popular constitutionalist literature. That is, the 1936 election and how the 
uh, a consensus in favor of the New Deal Constitution was created. Um, in one popular version of this, of this story, that is the question is, how did we come to have a national consensus in favor of the New Deal Constitution? In one popular uh, version of this story, told by Bruce Ackerman, and I'm caricaturing it slightly, I, I have to admit, um, the, um, the election um, uh, of 1936 was a fight between Roosevelt and the courts. Um, and the fight started when the courts held that a series of New Deal legislation was unconstitutional. Roosevelt uh, then just took on the courts and took the fight to the American people, um, who were then had to pick between his vision of the Constitution and the court's vision of the Constitution over whether uh, the uh, these laws should be upheld and whether the New Deal should be constitutional. And when they came to vote, the people uh, picked the New Deal. And so that, in this version of the story, is how the, the consensus over the New Deal was created. Because, because first the courts said no to Roosevelt, and then Roosevelt said, well, I'm taking it to the people, and the people chose Roosevelt. The only problem, well, there may be numerous problems with this story, but the central problem, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with, with this story, and we've talked a lot about narratives this morning, and narratives have an important role to play, the central problem with this story is that it is false. It didn't happen. Roosevelt did not uh, campaign against the courts. If you read the, the, the election literature, his campaign speeches, if you read the speeches from his supporters, he almost never mentioned the courts through the entire 1936 election campaign. There simply wasn't a fight between Roosevelt and the courts that was taken to the American people. So then how can we read the election of 1936 as, as supporting the New Deal vision if, it was, if they weren't picking between these two visions? What actually happened um, when you read the literature, and, the, what, and this is the a central point of, of, of the paper that the, this piece develops, is uh, that Roosevelt campaigned instead against the American Liberty League's vision of the Constitution. Um, and recognizing the key role of the American Liberty League in the 1936 election helps to explain um, uh, how the, the consensus about the New Deal understanding uh, was formed. So a, a little bit about the uh, history of the American Liberty League. Uh, uh, the Liberty League actually, interestingly, arose out of the repeal movement. The leaders of the, um, of the Liberty League um, um, uh, were uh, uh, the leaders of this major, probably the major uh, uh, movement for repeal um, called the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment. And by I say the leaders here, I mean uh, a, a number of persons, most prominently uh, members of the DuPont family, uh, John Raskob, who is the uh, former chairman of uh, General Motors and other industrial and corporate leaders. Um, Al Smith, the uh, 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 Democratic candidate in 1928 included. Um, and the particular vision, that, or particular way that the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment campaigned for repeal was using a, sp a kind of constitutional rhetoric. They uh, argued that prohibition was an example of, of federal overreaching. Um, that is, it, here it involved the government telling people what they could and couldn't do, and most especially telling business people what they could and couldn't sell. So the American Liberty, or I'm sorry, the, the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment saw in prohibition um, uh, a movement that was contrary to the American spirit of individualism, individual liberty, of local control, and limited government. Um, and so it was this constitution, the constitutional argument, the argument that prohibition was contrary to fundamental principles of, of American life uh, that drove their argument against, against prohibition. When they, when they won uh, the fight against prohibition and repeal was enacted, the executive committee of the uh, uh, Association Against the Prohibition Amendment said they were disbanding, but the executive committee will continue to meet from time to time, and they have in, the for in view the formation of a group which would, in the event of danger to the federal constitution, stand ready once again to defend the faith of the fathers. It didn't take long for them to see in the New Deal a new threat to the same, what they perceived to the same values as was uh, threatened by prohibition. In fact, if anything, they saw the New Deal as 
threatening these fundamental American values on a much broader scale. So within a year of the disbanding of the Association Against the Prohibition Amendment, the leaders of the movement start writing to each other about needing to form a new group. RRM Carpenter, who was a vice president at DuPont, um, wrote a letter to John Raskob saying, five Negroes on my place in South, of South Carolina refused work this morning or this spring saying they had easy jobs with the government. A cook on my houseboat quit because the government was paying them a dollar an hour as a painter. What can be done to save America? <laughs> um, and Raskob writes back, um, well, we should induce the DuPont and General Motors groups to work together again. Um, because in what we need is a new organization to, is a new organization says is needed to fight to protect society from the sufferings which it's bound to endure if we allow these communistic elements to lead the people to believe that all businessmen are crooks. So they need a new organization to fight for the same principles as uh, the, asso the Association Against the Repeal Amendment. So the American Liberty League is then founded in 1934 to carry out that mission. Um, and so they, and it says in its uh, charter statement, the American Liberty League was founded to defend and uphold the Constitution, and, it, and they invited all liberty-loving citizens to join the American League, which is doing everything possible, they said, to root out the vicious radical element that threatens the destruction of our government. Um, and it's important to note here that um, although the American Liberty League today is remembered, if at all, in, as a footnote in history. For a short while, in 1935 and 1936, it was the chief op uh, public opponent to the New Deal because the Republicans had little power, no money, and they had uh, caved in to Roosevelt's demands. So, and in fact, in 1936, the Liberty League had more office space, more staff, and spent more money than the Republican Party. And they were, uh, because they were, they were backed almost entirely by money from DuPont and General Motors, um, they were a publicity generating machine. For the 18 months leading up to the 1936 election, there are 400 articles in the New York Times that mention the American Liberty League. Um, you know, the League was formed to protect new rights. Um, you know, they the Liberty League claimed that pledges were pouring in, actually turned out not to be true. They, they expected three to four million people to join. They never had more than 100,000, but still they were able to generate a great deal of publicity for their claims that the New Deal was fundamentally un-American. And they, they issued um, pamphlet after pamphlet, which they distributed to millions of homes, um, and, they had, and they sponsored public speeches and national, nationally broadcast speeches on the radio that uh, put forward a vision that one could, one, or that I can only describe as one of constitutional nationalism. That is, they, you know, they see in the Constitution their vision for Americanism. That, that is, that Americanism uh, was fundamentally threatened. And Americanism is defined in the American Liberty League documents, very similar to how the Tea Party movement currently defines it as uh, a set of values to protect self-reliance, freedom from government regulation, opposition to collectivism, and they focused on the radical nature of the New Deal. They asked, you know, shall, the con shall we have constitutional liberty or dictatorship? They accused the uh, Roosevelt of committing constitutional heresy. And you can see, you know, some, many of their pamphlets are of a, you know, addressing smaller pieces of New Deal legislation like an act to uh, regulate uh, uh, potato uh, uh, agriculture, you know, which they describe as a ridiculous law making a travesty of constitutional liberties. Um, and they say that federal potato regulation is wholly foreign to American institutions. Potato control is another step towards socialism. Um, that is, they see in all of the New Deal programs something that's what they perceive to be fundamentally un-American. Um, you know, and they see, you know, that they, uh, in this speech, you know, again, distributed to millions of, uh, uh, of Americans. He says, you know, Karl Marx advocated a program which is strikingly, strikingly identif identical with the present program of the Roosevelt New Deal. At a, in 1936, Al Smith gave a nationally broadcast speech at an American Liberty League dinner, you know, in which he says, you know, there can only be one capital, Washington or Moscow. There can only be the clear, pure, fresh air of, of free America or the foul breath of communistic Russia, and Roosevelt had chosen the latter. Um, 
And so this is the set of arguments that the Liberty League is making. Now, what's interesting is that the, is Roosevelt's response. Roosevelt does not ignore the American Liberty League, but challenges it directly, challenges its, its uh, ideology uh, directly. First, in the uh, State of the Union address, he said, you know, a minority in business and industry engage in fast propaganda to spread fear and discord among the people. They would gang up against the people's liberties. But he, but he, so he directly addresses what he thinks is wrong with their constitutional vision. That is, shall we say to the unemployed, we will withdraw from giving you work? We will turn you back to the charity of those men of selfish power who tell you that perhaps they will employ you if the government leaves them strictly alone? That is, he says this constitutional vision being offered by the Liberty League is fundamentally immoral. And he makes a constitutional argument. You know, shall we say to the unemployed and the aged, social security lies not with the province of the federal government, you must seek relief elsewhere. That is, he answers their constitutional arguments with this moral argument. Um, and soon enough, the American, or the Roosevelt campaign, uh, had come to see, the Ameri had, had established a particular way of dealing with the American Liberty League, and James James Farley, who was the chairman of Roosevelt's re-election campaign in 1936, he says, look, the, the Liberty League seemed to be one of the most vulnerable ever to appear in politics. The Roosevelt re-election campaign was developed on that theory. That is, they decided to campaign against the Liberty League because they saw that they were so weak. And why were they weak? Well, because, he says, you know, we should call it the American Cellophane League, because first, it's a DuPont product, and second, you can see right through it. <laughs> that is, it's a... You know, and they campaigned against it as a millionaire's club um, that's transparently uh, adopting a program solely to help uh, cor uh, large corporations and millionaires. And he says, so our campaign strategy, that is the first battle order, was to ignore the Republican Party and to concentrate fire on the Liberty League. Um, the second order was to associate the Republicans with the Liberty League. And they said, you know, whether they like it or not, the Republican leaders represent the same forces of reaction that the Liberty League represents. So the Roosevelt re-election campaign saw the Liberty League as a useful foil that offered the chance to present the New Deal's constitutional vision in the most persuasive way. And, and Farley said, the more they work, the, the more they're in the paper, the happier we are. Um, and Roosevelt continues attacking the, uh, the Liberty League throughout the campaign. At his convention speak, he again attacks them as the, as the exemplars of the economic royalists. And he says, they say we're trying to overthrow the institutions of America. That is, what we're doing is fundamentally at odds with uh, what America is about. Um, but what they really seek is to take away, is they really are complaining that we're trying to take away their power. But our allegiance is to the American institutions, and that you know, requires the overthrow of their kind of power. And he takes on, again, their constitutional rhetoric. In vain, they seek to hide behind the flag in the Constitution. In their blindness, they forget, he says, what the flag in the Constitution stand for. So, so at the same time, when the Democrats are trying to, are focusing their energy on the Liberty League and trying to paint the Republicans as the puppets of the Liberty League, the Republicans are trying to run away from the Liberty League. Um, the Republicans begged uh, the Liberty League not to endorse Landon, um, but uh, it, uh, it didn't fool anyone because, in fact, the Liberty League's influence on the Re Republican parties was undeniable. Um, the DuPonts were the largest contributors to the Landon campaign, and uh, possibly because of, of this influence, or, or possibly not, the uh, Landon adopts much of the rhetoric of the Liberty League. The Republican platform that year used the constitutional rhetoric and complain about the New Deal being unconstitutional in a way that no Republican platform previously did or did afterwards. That is, uh, in this year, the focus was on the, the New Deal is unconstitutional. That's what they decided their, their campaign would be about. So they, you know, Landon says in his uh, convention speech, the essence of the New Deal is that the Constitution must go in order to give men in Washington the power to make America over, to destroy the American way of life, and establish a foreign way of life in its place. So 
So now you see what, the re what really, what the actual fight in 1936 is not between Roosevelt and the courts, but it's Roosevelt's vision of the Constitution against the Liberty League, which they chose to fight them on. That is, they selected the Liberty League and took them on as hard as they could because it allowed, gave them the opportunity to make their case in the most persuasive way possible. Um, and of course, the, the campaign result was a landslide for Roosevelt. Um, he won 61% of the vote, votes and got all but two states. And the election was widely understood, whether you know, correctly or not, as expressing a public consensus in favor of the New Deal and opposed to the Liberty League's vision. Um, so what, what, lessons, uh, what lessons can we draw from this? It seems to me one important lesson is that uh, is, to, is the importance of what I would call constitutional losers. Um, that is, the scholarship on popular constitutionalism has focused almost exclusively on movements that succeed in changing the understood meaning of the Constitution. You know, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gun rights movement. And of course, that makes sense given the narrative that they're wanting to tell. That is, that heroic movements come in, convince the American people of the correctness of their claims and the American people changed their mind about the Constitution and constitutional doctrine has changed. But in fact, um, it, public consensus over the uh, meaning of the Constitution only emerges from sustained conflicts. It doesn't emerge when there's just one party presenting its views to the American people, but but out of a dialogic process between two parties publicly engaging in uh, a fight over the meaning of the Constitution. And losing sides have a very important role to play. For one thing, they can force the winning side, as they did with Roosevelt, to refine their arguments in a more persuasive way. And sometimes a public consensus about the meaning of the Constitution can arise that the losing party is wrong just as much as that the winning side is right. So that's one set of, of uh, things I think that the 1936 election uh, teaches us. But then I, I, I want to get back to where I, where I began this by asking, could the story of the American Liberty League be a model for how liberals and progressives should respond to the Tea Party? Um, that is, is, is this story uh, a model for today? Well, of course, you know, 2012 is not 1936. The Tea Party movement is not the American Liberty League. But perhaps uh, liberals and progressives should not fear the Tea Party movement, but should instead see it as an opportunity. Because without the movement, without it generating lots and lots of press about uh, articulating its narrow and fixed vision of what America is and can, and can be and what the role of government is in that vision, we'd have no opportunity to persuade the public of our opposing vision of what the nation can be uh, and what the government's role in that could be. So with that, it's in my few minutes if other panelists want to respond to each other. Do you, either of you have any responses to what I said or what anyone said? Uh, well, I mean, my preference is always to give the audience who spent uh, their entire day coming out here plenty of time to, uh, to talk with us. Okay. Yeah. Is that all right with you, Mark? Unless, if but, you let me just say, <laughs> so I, I just, as, this is tremendously interesting. Uh, as part of the project, I, I wonder uh, the extent to which the focus on the Liberal League was what we would now call a, a sorry, a, a dog whistle about the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. That is, instead of going after the Supreme Court, they focused on the Liberty League. Yeah, that's probably right. The Liberty League was a better punching bag than the court, because the Liberty League you know, was known to be supported only by the DuPonts and to be uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, an organization that was doing the work of you know, millionaire uh, industrialists. And it was easier to say that these are the people who caused the depression in the first place, and their vision is, you know, this uh, one that would prevent us from helping you. And to put it, to put that, to attribute that vision to the Liberty League was certainly a lot more persuasive than attributing to the court, which might, you know, as an institution have been held in higher regard than Wall Street uh, industrialists. I wonder too, just very quickly, if you if you would comment because I was fascinated by. I, I'm pretty familiar with the ALL, and um, my understanding of the ALL it was it was a democratic movement. Yes. Right. I mean, it wasn't. It was an intra-party dispute amongst the Democrats 
Um, whereas Tea Party, of course, is, is, is an opposite party and their, and their ire is sort of directed more towards Democrats. Yeah. So, um, you know, I wish, you, I, I wish you'd comment a little bit about that because when I look at the ALL, I actually see a closer parallel between the ALL and Occupy Wall Street than I see between the ALL and the Tea Party movement, at least structurally, yeah. other than the, the, the raw, you know, yeah. fact of this, um, this constitutional nas nationalism. Right. That, that is, I think their ideology of the Tea Party movement and the American Liberty League are very similar. That is, if you open up any of the pamphlets of the Liberty League, they, they could have been written by, by a Tea Party. Yeah. The organization, I agree, is entirely different. That is, American Liberty League was a central, or was a single organization. It wasn't a movement. They tried to make it into a movement and failed. Um, and it did begin just as you start, as you said, as a movement of members of the Democratic Party. I mean, Al Smith, John Raskob, all of these uh, uh, people who had broken with or had a fight with Roosevelt started the, the movement. And they tried to convince the Democratic Party not to renominate Roosevelt and Smith in the same speech that I uh, quoted from here. It says he's going to take a walk on the party if, if they renominate him. He did. But then they then tried to influence the Republicans. They then contributed to, to the Republican Party. They told them, you know, they had strong ideas about who the Republicans should nominate, gave money to, to those people. Smith campaigned for Landon. Um, uh, and some of the others would have campaigned more, more for, uh, for Landon if they'd been, if, except that the Republicans didn't want them to because they started getting tarred as the, as the Liberty League uh, uh, Party. Um, yes. Yeah, oh, and by, by the way, I, I'm going to need to, let me get, give you a microphone, because someone in the overflow room has told me they can't hear any of the oh, questions. Okay. So let me, let me uh, use a microphone for the question. Uh, despite the, uh, the all-star uh, um, uh, panels that we've had uh, to discuss all this, uh, one expertise that I, I think is missing here uh, is anthropology. And in particular, uh, the anthropology of religion. Uh, it, it seems to me that American constitutionalism has very strong roots in Protestantism. Uh, the attitude that uh, there's a document, the, the Bible, uh, which everybody accepts as the, the truth, um, but that with Protestantism comes the tradition uh, of everybody having their own opportunity uh, to read the Bible and to read their own meaning into it. Uh, they appoint their own ministers um, with the idea that um, uh, they want to find people who will uh, do the best job possible enabling them to reach their own uh, kind of understanding of the literature and, and with God. And in many ways, people have claimed that American constitutionalism comes out of Massachusetts, comes out of the relationship uh, with the Bible and with the, um, the charter of the, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Corporation. Uh, so, uh, I, I, it, and again, there's this idea of people being included in, included out, uh, using the document and an interpretation of it as um, the basis for doing that. Uh, now, I, I wonder what your, your view is about whether looking into that kind of um, human um, behavior, um, both in the religious realm and in this country in particular, uh, it takes the form with um, um, the pilgrims, uh, um, what that might shed on this notion of, of popular constitutionalism. Um, you, here, I'll take the back. Um, Mark, if, this, if you don't mind playing, playing poker to our, uh, our gathering here. Um, Mark, did you want to comment? Uh, well, I, I suppose my first the first thing I have to say is that's that's quite literally not my church. So you know what I have to say. About it. Well, but your church isn't that different when it comes to interpreting the well, that's, and arguing that's about the document. Uh, well, that's true, and and I think that's a significant point. The sort of uh, if you take that point of view, it, which is incidentally developed in the constitutional literature uh, by Sandy Levinson. Uh, um, uh, you're going to almost inevitably generate a proliferation of denominations or sects or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and, and figuring out how the larger entity, the religion or the nation, can accommodate this plurality of interpretive approaches is a tricky matter. Uh, 
And, and that's really all that I can say. It's just, it's hard to figure out how, where you have this sort of Protestant interpretive tradition, uh, you're going to have something that you're going to be able to identify as a tradition. And I would just say that, you know, I do think there's a deep human uh, tendency to, um, to, to write texts and then what texts become important in a, in a sort of, a, you know, meta level on society, that that society that uh, embraces that text wants to preserve it and to honor it. So I, I would see that in no difference from the Bible than I would the Constitution. I mean, they're obviously... Uh, different kinds of text, but the, the the importance of the text itself and honoring and preserving the text, I think, is is a similar motivation between the Bible and the Constitution. Uh, but of course, you know, I've, I've read the Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm not a particularly religious person myself, but uh, you know, it's it's um, it's a little bit harder to uh, discern. Uh, a definitive meaning to uh, metaphorical stories in the Bible than there is, uh, you know, the constitutional text. I do think uh, one is notably uh, clearer uh, than the other. Um, and, and, you know, I think that the Tea Partiers have, um, have you know, been, been sort of demeaned and disparaged because they, you know, there have been you know, media reports about how they revere the Constitution and they uh, they revere it so much, it's almost like going to the me a meeting is like attending a Bible study. Um, and you have to put that in context because the people who are writing these stories uh, and drawing this analogy are probably people who are quite secular in their worldview. Uh, they don't think the Bible is a particularly good thing. They don't think that's worth preserving. And they're carrying over that idea to the Constitution, too. And I do think that that's um, a generally identifiable progressive trend, both with the Bible and the Constitution. Um, let, me, let me ask Willie for a minute. Willie, go ahead. Um, well, here. I just to say something first. All right. All Thank you, Jared. I, I wanted to pick up quickly on Elizabeth's question. As a, as a board member of one of the Tea Party organizations in Rhode Island, um, I, you know, I see a competing characterization by it when you compare the uh, the Tea Party movement for for the sake of convenient analogy and not forsaking all other to the American Liberty League. I I think a very significant distinction she applies is in a sense that the kind of relationship to an elite vision of the Constitution or to a to a, a funded vision. I mean, I hear things go better with Coke, but I'm not getting the checks. So, uh, you know, I think this is that, that in many ways the, the, the movement is as comparable to the civil rights movement, which I lived through, as anything else. And I'm just wondering if you have, uh, that was convenient, I appreciate the comparison. Have you compared it to more really popular movements? Sure. Yeah, that is, yeah, the, the comparison that I, that I mean to draw is only in its ideology. I think, I mean, it's not, it may not even be fair to call the American Liberty League a movement. It, it's a failed movement. It's an organization that didn't take off as a movement. But it was a public opponent of Roosevelt that used a very similar ideology and a similar set of rhetoric. And, and it may well be that because the American Liberty League wasn't a movement, that it was much easier for Roosevelt to attack than it would be for Obama to attack the, the Tea Party movement. That is, you can attack the Liberty League as the symbols of entrenched greed because they were actually uh, it, the, uh, <laughs> in, uh, controlled by you know, uh, millionaires. The same isn't, I mean, you can say that about the Tea Party movement. Sometimes you'll hear liberals call the Tea Party movement uh, astroturf and pretend as if it's not a real movement. But I, I don't think that they, they, you get any traction from that. And I, I agree that, that, that it's much harder to fight uh, a grassroots movement, um, even if it has the same vi constitutional vision as the American Liberty League. Um, now we're going to Promo literature, it seemed like you were saying, beware constitutional nationalism. Let me show you, you know, its, its ills and perils. Um, but <coughs> I don't quite hear you saying that now. And, and in any event, it seems worth pressing on because it is a dilemma for progressives, right? That there's a tension. There's the, the nationalism of the Tea Party um, is robust and unabashed, right? 
I don't think that it's very easy to form a, a good counter to the Tea Party. I, I, I agree with you. Taking on the Tea Party helps sharpen the stakes helps force progressives to say, well, what are our fundamental commitments? But I think we are talking the same language, and that, that, and that what, the, what, what the American Liberty League provoked Roosevelt to do was not to eschew nationalism, to say, what does it mean? What, what do we owe one another as a nation? Right. Um, and that does, in willy-nilly, mean there are people who are not part of the nation. Right? Um, so, on one hand, right, the, you kind of used images of the Tea Party that suggested that they were tarring Obama as outside the nation, right? There are those who write about the Tea Party as though there is a kind of ethno-racial nationalism that Professor Foley was saying, that's not ours. But nationalism is always partly about, you know, who we are and what we owe one another, and with a progressive nationalism, even more so than a libertarian one, it's about how we share our resources. And if resources are finite and progressives are about a more generous right, welfare state, for example, hmm, there is a problem, right? And one that progressives wrestle with. But I don't think that it's wise to say, because I don't think you can make a constitutional case, a popular constitutional case, very easily for a progressive wish, vision without what some people call civic nationalism, inclusive nationalism, immigrant nationalism, what people abroad call constitutional patriotism. These are all fancy ways of saying that a nation has boundaries and part in this, in this world, that part of sort of promoting egalitarian societies is some form of nationhood. Can I? Yeah, please. I'll respond to you, but, uh, but uh, uh, um, This notion, I, I want to say two things. One, this notion of um, uh, constitutional nationalism goes back a long way. So I once wrote an article that quotes, I think it's Hector St. John Crevker, what then is this American, the new, the new man? And in that tradition, what the American is, is the person who is committed to the principles of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. That's the first point. Second point is that, um, uh, to, to claim a certain amount of, uh, um, I don't know, paternal ownership of the notion of popular constitutionalism, in taking the Constitution away from the courts, my argument was that popular constitutionalism should focus on the Declaration of Independence and in particular the, uh, well, the Declaration and the preamble uh, of the Constitution. Forget about the details is what I said. It's the Declaration and the preamble that matters. Um, and and uh, third, I actually think, I mean, there are important implications about national boundaries. Uh, but if you have this kind of vision, um, uh, they become, I think, technical prudential questions, not principled ones. My view is anybody, anywhere in the world, who is committed to the principles of the Declaration and the preamble is presumptively entitled, in some sense, to be a member of the, Nash the US commu constitutional community. Now, there are prudential reasons about why that can't actually happen, which is the welfare state kind of thing. But, um, you know, uh, uh, but that's my starting point, the, the, that the, these principles, which are in form, except for providing for the common defense, they are um, universal principles, right. uh, universal meaning, available to everybody, no matter where they're located. I, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm down. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I have to say that I'm, for, on the record, not down with constitutional nationalism, although I am, I am especially skeptical. I mean, what, the part of it that troubles me the most is that when the, the, I, the notion of the Constitution is very narrowly understood, and then combining that with uh, national identity being defined by commitment to a narrow set of values, because it excludes more people. 
that it's because I, in the Tea Party's vision of America, I have been excluded. I am not a true American in their view because I hold views that are contrary to their vision of America. And so that is really what gets me in my gut to say something is wrong here. But I do think even a progressive, I mean, I think that, you know, so, I mean, that's the, the core of what, you know, drives me in, in writing this stuff. Um, but even that said, I think even a, a progressive constitutional nationalism is still going to have some dividing line between who we are and who they are defined by the Constitution. I just don't find in the Constitution my sense of my identity. I, I just think that we have to create a lot of fictions to, to think that the Constitution somehow embodies especially a fixed notion of who we are and who we can be. That is, who we are, it, you know, was, it means what it says in the, in the Constitution, then we have to construe the Constitution to embody all of our deepest commitments. I just don't think that the text can bear it. Um, and I don't think that we need to, or at least I would hope that we don't need to. I recognize that American politics, the way we talk about who we are as a nation is through this constitutional language. And so I could say, like, I believe in a right to health care because I think it's a fundamental right and that I'm going to find in the Constitution. But for me to say that is to, you know, is to really to create a lie. That is, I believe in health care and I believe it's a fundamental right, but I can't find that in the Constitution and I, I don't want to have to try. So. And, and can I just respond to, because, I mean, uh, you know, the, the label constitutional na nationalism, my reaction was, so what? The Constitution is a national document. Um, all constitutions are national documents. And one of the foundational principles of the Tea Party that I identify in the book, besides limited government and, and originalism, is what I call an unapologetic defense of U.S. sovereignty. And it has deep roots. I mean, the, the founders themselves were steeply, you know, uh, uh, in, immersed in uh, the law of nations, guys like Vattel and Grotius and Pufendorf, right? And uh, they understood very intimately this law of nations. And one of the foundational principles of the law of nations was that sovereigns are, first of all, they're sovereign, they're distinct, there is no one world government. They're distinct sovereigns and they have a right to defend their borders. Um, and, and I think that that is something, again, that, um, you know, unless you're going to say that we don't have a right to defend our borders or that borders are meaningless, which I know some people say that on a principled basis, but it, it's not consonant with the idea of having our own constitution and our own uh, distinct legal structure. Um, and, and I would just say that, that to the extent you use it in any sort of pejorative way, that constitutional na nationalism is a bad word, um, you know, it, 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 realize that the, the, it's not the Tea Partiers that have this market cornered. All of us do this. Anytime someone doesn't agree with our vision of the Constitution, we label them un-American. You need look no further than, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer's op-ed in the Wall Street, uh, not the Wall Street Journal, but the USA Today, uh, when all the uh, Tea Party town hall protests were occurring, remember when everybody was showing up in droves to protest the health care reform law? I think it was 2009, right? Summer 2009. Uh, and so they, they wrote this op-ed in, in uh, the USA Today where they called the Tea Partiers, quote unquote, un-American. So it, it's not just the Tea Partiers, we oh, all do it. Yeah, I, I, that I, I fully agree with, yes. Thank you very much. What, the oh, um, let, let me give you a microphone. Thank The concepts you articulated, I think, are so relevant and proved by the fact that the Progressive Party in 2011, August, uh, announced a contract for the American dream, which I think was sort of a, a sort of fighting the Tea Party, the Tea Party way. It sort of seemed to get overshadowed by Occupy. But as a Republican who ran in 2010 and who needed to try and uh, refine the raw voice of the Tea Party and make it useful as a Republican and being a lawyer also. I ended up sort of going this way. How do I speak to the idea that what the Tea Party wants and what the Tea Party, uh, what the progressives want, are not necessarily impossible or mutually exclusive, that the Constitution does allow us by extending principle, uh, neutral principles equally to everybody and through the amendment process and through the commerce power to achieve some common goals. And so my campaign signs end up having a slogan that said, the American dream, the American way. And that was my way of trying to reconcile the Tea Party raw voice with the idea that it is part of America. Social, social security is part of America. Um, 
the idea that, uh, you know, against patient dumping at, at emergency rooms is part of America at this point. And that was, so what you said I think is so relevant and, and I ended up having to struggle with that and that's what I came up with, the American dream, the American way. That was my political way of responding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we actually have to close it off there. We've run over.